Well, good morning, everyone. I've been up and down here half a dozen times, but welcome to the Sunday morning service, the first one of 2017. Um, I trust that everyone has had a good Christmas and that you're looking forward to a, a stronger spiritual year coming forward. Um, as usual, um, any visitors are very, very welcome. And just a wee reminder for them, or a note for them, that there's tea and coffee afterwards, so you're welcome to come along to that as well. Our speaker this morning is Willie Logan from the Belfast City Mission, and Willie, we look forward to hear what you have to tell us later on. Being the first Sunday of the year, I've just been given a million adverts, because you noticed there wasn't a, a, a form. You'll have seen them this morning, it's not behind me now, it's only me, you can see, but you'd have seen this morning all the usual stuff that's up there. But a few more announcements. There's no evening service this evening, but next Sunday morning is communion, and your, your um, elders should be giving out the relevant tokens for that this morning. Um, the session, having a away day this Saturday, at meeting here at half past 10, and finishing at half past four approximately. Um, and committee, just something for your diary. Uh, our next meeting is scheduled for Monday the 16th of January. So that's just advance notice for you. Um, 2016 givings. Martin will keep me right on this, but I think the last date for that is, he's not here, is he? Yeah, it's okay. The last date for 2016 givings is next Sunday the 8th. And if you don't get them in by that stage, they'll be accredited to your 2017 givings. Um, okay, PW, um, would all PW members please stay after church for five minutes in the corner of the church. Betty's looking to, to get a hold of you. On the same sort of theme, uh, Margaret would like to speak to everyone about the, um, the dinner, I think, that's been set up for PW, and also to remind those that haven't as yet paid for Wider World to pay that this week, please. Joan has told me that the Christmas card, which was, if you remember, was, was there. A big thank you to everyone who contributed to the Congregational Christmas card. Donations for Marie Curie came to £175. And then finally, Sam's still walking. And he tells me that the walking group will meet tomorrow morning uh, on Monday the 2nd of January. We did a church for 10 o'clock. The walk is from Helens Bay Car Park to Crawford Spring Country Park and the car park back to the church for tea, coffee, etc. for about 12 o'clock to 12.15 or thereabouts. We're meeting with the, the walkers from Knock and we'll meet down there with them at 10.30. So any healthy people who want to go walking tomorrow, Sam's your man for a bargain. But we're here to worship God, aren't we? And whoops, that's not very good. We're here to worship God, so let's do that with our first singing. Our first song looks back, uh, let us to praise God. Let's stand, for, Lord, for the years your love has kept and guided, sought us and saved us, pardoned and provided. Let's stand to sing.
<clears throat> Let's come to God in prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can come to you together in prayer. You are the almighty God, the creator and sustainer of all things. Thank you that you've been with us over the last year, urging us and inspiring us, guiding us, and being with us, each one, through good times and through difficult times. We know that you're always there and close to each one of us. Even you are the all-powerful God, you know each one of us personally and love us. Lord, we also thank you for the Lord Jesus who came to this earth when the time was right in your plan of salvation. Help us to grow more and more in our faith, both as individuals and as a congregation. Lord, as our session meet to discuss the spiritual things of the congregation, inspire them, set their minds ablaze for you, teach them what is needed in this place and encourage them to be examples to the whole congregation, leading in your ways that you may be glorified in this place and that through their leadership, all may be blessed and others brought to know their need of you and that saving grace you so readily provide. Similarly, Lord, we would ask for your guidance to our church committee who meet shortly and take care of the practical and financial needs of the congregation. You have given us this excellent building. Help us to use it to the maximum and to ensure your word reaches out to Sydenham and further afield. Lord, we think of the children who are in our organisations and who come to Sunday services. We ask that you bless them in all that they do and all that they hear. Help them and their leaders, now that the Christmas and its excitement is over, to rededicate themselves to learning and teaching more and more this year. Finally, Lord, each one of us has their own particular needs and wants. And in the silence now, each one will bring these to you in the sure knowledge that you hear us and answer in your way. Lord, we bring our prayers to you in and through the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Amen. Children, go. Actually, Marty, you go too. Our second praise, folks, is by Francis Van Elstein, praising my Saviour all the day long. Let's stand to sing, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine.
We turn now to the, the Bible and we read from 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 to 22. For I'm already poured out like a drink offering, and the time has come for my departure. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. Do your best to come to me quickly, for Demas, because he loved this world, has deserted me and has gone to Thessalonica. <coughs> Crescens has gone to Galatia and Titus to Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, because he is helpful to me in my ministry. I sent Tychicus to Ephesus. When you come, bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas and my scrolls, especially the parchments. Alexander the metal worker did me a great deal of harm. The Lord will repay him for what he has done. You too should be on your guard against him because he strongly opposed our message. At my first defense, no one came to my support, but everyone deserted me. May it not be held against them. But the Lord stood at my side and gave me strength so that through me, the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. And I was delivered from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet, Pris greet Priscilla and Aquila and the household of Onesiphorus. Erastus stayed in Corinth. I left Trephimus Sick in Miletus, do your best to get there before winter. Abulus greets you, and so do Pudens, Linus, Claudia, and all the brothers. The Lord be with your spirit. Grace be with you. Amen. Before Willie comes to speak to us then, let's stand and sing again. Great is thy faithfulness, O God my Father. There is no shadow of turning in thee. Let's stand.
That's a, a lovely hymn, isn't it? And that reminds us that God is faithful to us, uh, not just in the first day of the year, but every day of the year, every moment of every day, because uh, we're reminded in Lamentations 3, it is good, to, or sorry, because of the Lord's great love, we're not consumed, for his compassions never fail, for they're new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. It's the constant we have in life is God and his faithfulness. And I trust at the start of this year, 2017, that it might be a better year for you than maybe the year it's just gone. But I would suggest, like every year, it's just going to be a mixture of good and bad because that's life, that's a reality. And the Bible reminds us that through much trial and tribulation we enter the kingdom. But it's good to know that God is in control of all things. But I was wondering when Danny spoke to me a few weeks ago and asked me to come. And then last week he says, have you got a reading? I thought to myself, no, I haven't. Um, And then I I realized how close it was the 1st of January. I didn't realize it was just a week away. And I thought on a theme. And I thought in this passage, and that's why I I chose uh, 2 Timothy. Because we're going to look at a theme. But we're going to look at this passage and develop the theme. But we'll do that in a few moments. Let's just pray again before I bring the message to you. Let's just pray. Father, we thank you for all that you've already done for us since we opened our eyes this morning. We thank you for the homes that we have come from, the food that we have been able to take, and the journey that we have uh, done to arrive here safely, then to come and to worship you with like-minded people. I pray a blessing upon all here today. I don't know them, Lord. Uh, You know them. You know what goes on in their lives, just like you know what goes on in my life and my family. And I pray just at the start um, of this year and this service that each one would have confidence in that triune God. You know us better than we know ourselves. And Father, we just ask that each one of us would put our trust fully in you this year to accept what lies ahead And to realize that you will never leave us nor forsake us because you've promised that in your word. So help us as we look at your word now. Just open it up to us again that we might uh, get better insight into all that you have to say. uh, Through the reading of that word and the, the meditation upon it. That we would be better and stronger to face what lies ahead this week. For we pray all these things in Jesus name. Amen. Let me ask you a question just as we start this morning. If you were told today, first day of January 2017, that you only had a certain amount of time left to live, how would it change your attitude towards life? In other words, how would you do things differently than perhaps you've been doing them up to now? How would you spend your last days here on earth? You know, to a greater or even a lesser extent, what we believe about the future determines how we live today in the present. Very often we don't realize or we don't appreciate how important our time is until it's way too late. You know, when a person finds out that they've got a terminal illness, What's the first thing they normally say to the consultants they sit in the hospital? How long have I got? Isn't that right? You want to know, is it weeks? Is it months? Have I got maybe a diagnosis that will give me three, five, seven years? We don't know. But you normally want to find out, don't you? It's strange in a way that we only begin to to take life seriously when we realize that our time is limited that we have been given more or less a date in which we're going to depart. And the thought of death has a wonderful way of concentrating and focusing our minds on what's really important in life. Yet most of us, let's be honest, don't think we're going to die just right now. And so we let time and our lives slip past very, very quickly. The psalmist wrote in Psalm 90 those familiar words. For all our days are passed away in thy wrath. And we spend our years as a tale that is told. And the days of our years are threescore years and ten. And if by reason of strength they be fourscore years. Yet in their strength they labor and sorrow. 
Who knows the power of your anger? Even according to your fear, so is your wrath. And then it says this in verse 12. So teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts on to wisdom. Now it's impossible for you or I to number our days. Because no one knows how many days we've got left to live. But that's precisely the point that's being made. Numbering our days if we knew exactly would keep us from you know, that ultimate folly of believing that we're always going to get a little bit extra time to live. You know, recently in the news there was that case, I don't know if you remember it, of a young girl, I think she was maybe about 14 or 15, and she won the right to have her body frozen in the hope that science somehow in the future will bring her back to life. It's a science, isn't it, cryonics? The pioneer in that science, he died a number of years ago. But his son wrote this. I looked this up. And he said this. My father devoted himself to doing what he could to enable the family and his friends and others to come back and live again. And whether he will achieve that, nobody knows at this point. But we think he has a good chance. Sadly and tragically, that man is wrong. And anyone who infests in that science is wrong. And we know it's wrong because the Bible tells us that it's appointed unto man once to die. You see, when you die, you're not coming back this way again. Therefore, to infest your money and your time and your hope in science is a waste. It's a false hope. The only hope that you have today to live again is what Jesus says. He that believes on the Son has everlasting life. It's a free gift. You can have it today. As we come to the end of chapter 4 here in 2 Timothy, we're reading the testimony and the final recorded words of that great apostle. And after he wrote these last few verses, he put his pen down and the curtain closes on his life. What happened has been debated for 2,000 years. But it's more than likely that Paul was taken from his prison cell in Rome under the orders of the emperor Nero, and he was beheaded. But before that happened, he was able to give his testimony of the assurance because he wrote, For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give to me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. It wouldn't be long before that great apostle would hear those words that I trust everyone in here will hear from the lips of the master someday. Well done, thy good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. That's what we want to hear at the end of life's journey. You know, the Bible has a lot to say about life and about time. And the most significant thing that it says is something that you and I already know. And it's this, our time is limited. We are not going to live forever this side of eternity. One of the most recognizable passages And the Bible talks about time. And it reminds us there's a time for everything. And that's in Ecclesiastes 3. To everything there's a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven. A time to be born. A time to die. A time to plant and a time to pluck up that which is planted. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up. Although we don't always have the time to do everything that we want to do. I believe God in his goodness gives us the time for the things that we need to do. Especially with regards to spiritual matters. In other words, to make sure you're right with God. Should your time come to end on this earth very quickly. Although we don't always have time. We know we do have the present we have today. No one gets more time than anyone else. Doesn't matter whether you're young or old, rich or poor, whether you're a Christian or not a Christian. Because God in his goodness every morning gives us 24 hours. He doesn't give someone 25 because they came to church and give someone 24 because they didn't bother. 
God doesn't work that way. That means all of our time belongs to God. And what you do with the hours and the days and the months and the years that God gives you is very, very important. Because someday each one of us will stand in front of a holy God. And we will be asked, what have you done with your life? What have you done with the time that I give you? Someone wrote this. Time is the coin of your life. It's the only coin you have. And only you can determine how you spend it. But be careful. Lest you let other people spend it for you. Time matters, doesn't it? Because time is the stuff of life. And when it's gone, it's gone forever. It can be used. It can be wasted. It can be infested. It can be misspent. But remember when it's gone, it's gone. It will never be regained. You know, sometimes when you're chatting with a friend, you might ask, look at the time. Where did the time go? And they'll say, I have to go on of somewhere else to go to. You know, I got a, a message there the other day from a guy I used to play rugby with. And we won. I used to play for Randallstown, you wouldn't think by the ship of it, but about 15 years ago we won the league. And it's a reunion dinner they're going to have. And I thought, is it really that long since we won that? You know, the time goes very quickly. And as you get older, it goes much, much quicker. Benjamin Franklin said, do you love life? Then do not squander time, for that is the stuff which life is made of. Therefore, what you do today with the moments and the minutes and the opportunities, the people that you talk to, is so, so important. Because sooner or later, your time will be gone or their time will be gone. You know, all of us are slaves to time, aren't we? In one way or another. These days, people are glued to the mobile phones. You walk down the street, everybody's got the mobile phone. They don't really go and visit people anymore. They send tax. I, I don't know about you, but we get less Christmas cards this year, and we sent less. Maybe it's because you speak to people on the, on the phone, or you tax them, or whatever it may be. Isn't that right? You know, I've got two girls, and sometimes I'd hear my phone bleeping, and I'd go and pick it up. She's upstairs. What time's the dinner ready? That's not the way they work these days. And to see if time, we, we, we've changed our, the way we communicate. You know, there's people sitting here, and you can remember writing a letter. You ask a youngster today to write a letter, they wouldn't even know what to do. And then we've got email, and then instant messaging, and Facebook, and my, MySpace, and then, is it Snapchat, and Twitter. What's Twitter all about? You know, you see people twittering what they got for dinner. I couldn't care less what they got for dinner. As long as I got my dinner, I don't care about anybody else. And you rush about, don't you? You don't want to be late for an appointment. And you hammer down the road. As long as there's no police around you, you're okay, aren't you? But you don't want to be late. People organize things months in advance. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. Because time is so important. We will spend time, sorry, money today to save time. But a few generations ago, people spent time to save money, didn't they? Think about it. But 200 years ago, less than 10% of the population had a clock in their house. And those who had a clock, it didn't have a minute hand or a second hand. Alarm clocks and wristwatches didn't come into the end of the 19th century. But today we've got computers with, with precision, timing. And so we have to be very careful. As we look at these passages just for a few minutes... I wanted to, to, to give you that type of information to get you thinking about time and how it's important, how it relates to your life, then to look how it related to Paul's life. Paul realized when he wrote these words that he did not have much time left to live. But what was in his mind right at the end of his life? Well, first of all, he thought about his friends. His last recorded words are mostly about people. Maybe it was a wee bit strange, that full reading with all those names right towards the end. But I, I, I ask for that reading. It's because it reminds us that people were important to Paul. And people are important to us as well. In his final days, he thought about this man called Demas. At one time, he was a dear friend of Paul. But now Paul writes that he had deserted him. He's left him alone. 
Well, Paul needed this man, this good friend, right at the end of life. Where was he? He was gone. Maybe he looked at Paul in the dungeon in Rome, sitting in the dump in chains, and he thought, is this the way I'm going to end up if I'm a Christian? Am I going to end up losing my life for the sake of Christ? And he thought, I'm not having it. And he went back into the world, and he deserted Paul. And you know what happens, doesn't it, in life? People start out to be a Christian and things are great at the beginning. Then a little bit of trouble comes along and they think, I can't handle this anymore. It was easier not to be a Christian. And it's true, it is easier not to be a Christian. But remember what the reward is at the end of life. When you are a Christian and when you're not a Christian. A little bit of difficulty won't make up for an eternity lost without Christ. He also sent greetings to Timothy. He gives thanks to God, the one who stood by him through every trial. And you know you can look back over your life. In the past number of years, God was with you. He didn't take the trial away from you, but he was with you. He brought you through the trial because you're sitting here today. God is faithful. And he'll be faithful, no doubt, to you this in coming year as well. He never was forsaken. But he wanted his friend Timothy to come and see him. While he was in prison before he died. And that aged prophet. Or sorry apostle. Desperately wanted his young friend to come. <coughs> Listen. You know time and time again. He repeated that come to me quickly. You know and so forth. In verse 13. It seems that he expected Timothy to come. Because he requested him to bring things. When he came to him in prison. And in verse 21, he says, do your best to get here before winter. In other words, he's saying to Timothy, if you are going to visit me here, would you come and would you do it now? Don't, don't delay it. Because if you delay it, I might be dead. Come quickly. Come before the winter sets in. And most of us know the story of, of Timothy and Paul. Timothy was a young man. Paul was, a, was an older man. They struck up a friendship. Paul led this young man to the Lord. And he, and he nurtured him. He, did, he discipled him. And he brought him on, on missionary journeys. He saw potential in young people. And goodness knows what, you know, the young people have maybe gone to Sunday school today. What potential there is in a young life if you spend time with them. Give them the opportunities. And hopefully they will grow up to be men and women of God. And as Christians, we know that we can have friends of any age. But we know best of all, we have a friend that sticks closer than a brother. And that's the Lord Jesus. <clears throat> Paul knew there were some things he couldn't put off. That they needed to be done now because death was very soon going to be upon him. Many years ago, Martin Luther King stood on the Lincoln Memorial steps in 1963. And he gave that great speech. I have a dream. But he said this. We have also come to this hallowed spot. To remind America. Of the fierce urgency of now. You see he understood the present. Was so important. The past was gone. The future was not guaranteed. But why did Paul want Timothy to come before winter? Well, the answer to that is quite simple. It's a practical um, reason. During the winter months, the weather obviously turned for the worse. We have to remember Timothy was miles and miles away in a place called Ephesus. Paul was in Rome. To make that journey back 2,000 years ago would have taken weeks. They didn't have modern transport systems. And if Timothy delayed it, bad weather would have stopped ships from sailing across the Mediterranean. And so he had to say to him, if you're going to come, make your plan to come and see me now. You know, in our case today, if you're a Christian, there's some things that must be done before winter sets in or they'll never be done at all. You see, there's doors of opportunity that open only now. They might not open in the future. And if you don't take advantage of those, if you don't walk through that open door, it might close in you. Very often opportunity only knocks once. We all live busy lives. But that's no excuse for not attending to those things that are so important to do. Very often we can make ourselves look busy, can't we? With trivial matters. 
I remember I used to work in a bank in London and there was a guy in the office with me in financial services and he was the laziest creator you could have worked with. But he always made himself look busy. He had two big trays with files and if you walked past he pulled one out and the rest of the time he was reading the, the, the recent post. It's easy to do that, to make yourself look busy. But I'm sure there's things that need to be done in this church. But are you expecting someone else to do it? Are you expecting the minister or the elders or those who sit in the committee to do everything? What is God calling you to do in 2017 in the Strand that could make it a better place to draw people in from the community who do not have a church background? Don't leave it up to someone else. You know, if you are in the will of God and you're walking with the Lord, and you do invite people and you visit people, God will bless you for that. So many Christians miss out in blessing because they cannot be bothered to do things. That's so sad. We have to do it because, you know, our life is only a paper we don't know. Life changes so quickly. You get up in the morning, everything can be fine, but you go to the doctor, you get your results. Life changes. What then? Life is fragile. Life is brief. And death is certain. Paul requested some things. I'm not really going to go into that. It was a simple list. You know, at the end of his life, Paul didn't ask for a lot. It's quite often if you go to the home of someone and maybe or a hospital bed and you know that they're dying, their requests are not for big things anymore because they realize they're not important. You know what Paul wanted most of all when he died? There was a couple of things. He wanted a, a cloak or a coat. Something practical. And that reminds us that God is interested in the practical things in your life. That you've got food on the table. And over in Sandy Row, we've got a food bank now in the mission. We started it. We saw a need in the area. We've got it done for just over a year now. And we started to help families that we weren't able to get into before. And some of the people come in, you sit with them, the stories of people you think everything's okay in the community because you don't know what's going on behind that front door. Some of them are very, very sad tales. So Paul wanted the coat to keep warm. Remember he'd left it with someone called Carpus. We don't know who he was. Maybe at one time Paul says, look, mate, you take my coat. You've more need of it than I have. But now the tables have turned and Paul is in need. But the thing he wanted most of all was his Bible. He wanted the parchments. He wanted the, you know, the scrolls. And I would say they were Paul's own writings or maybe the, the Old Testament writings. But they were the words I think of the Lord Jesus himself. Those promises that he gave to Paul to comfort him in his time of need. That's what Paul wanted. I wonder at the end of your life, would you want your Bible? Or would you want something else? But lastly, just to bring this all together, let me ask you this. Would you have gone? Paul made the request for Timothy to come and see him. Would you have gone? Perhaps you would say, yes, I would go. If I had a friend and they needed me at the last, I would be there. But how many times have we promised friends and neighbours, if you need me, give me a wee call. But you don't help. You're hoping maybe they don't call. You're hoping they'll call somebody else because you know what, you can't be bothered. Because it might inconvenience you. Because you want to sit and watch the football or whatever it might be in television. You don't want to get up on a cold night and go and visit someone. But you know... We should be able to get up and do those things for God. Many of us live today with regrets because we haven't gone when we should have. We haven't picked up the phone and spoke to someone when we should have. Just over a year ago, there was a man, we do a, a breakfast for homeless men in Sandy Row. There was a man, he was an alcoholic, he came down and for his breakfast, he didn't eat a big lot. He was... Just like the drink. And he got a wee flat and I had food. I got him a couple of bags of groceries. I had it in the, the boot of the car for him. I saw him uh, um, walking down Sandy Road. It was, it was team of marine and I couldn't get stopped. And I says, I'll get down and see him before the week's out. Before the week was out, he was dead. 
Too little, too late. Do you think I regret that? Yes, I do. Every single day I regret that. Because I don't know where he's at in eternity. And I had an opportunity to help. Truly meant well, but things didn't turn out that way. And you're left with regret if only. What service could you render today in this church, as I said, or in the community, or in your family? What's Jesus saying to you? He's saying this, do it before winter, but do it before your life is over. There's a Quaker saying, says, I expect to pass through this world but once. Any good, therefore, that I can do, or any kindness that I may show to any fellow creature, let me do it now. Let me not defer it or neglect it, for I shall not pass this way again. And I started this message by asking a question and going to finish it by asking a question. Maybe narrow it down even a wee bit more. If you were told today was your last day, what would you do? What would you do if you're told by 12 o'clock tonight your life is going to be finished? You know, when a question like that is often asked, we think it's theoretical, don't we? Because no matter what age you are, no matter what kind of health you have, you think, well, I've still got a wee bit more in me. Still a few miles in the tank. But what would you do? For some I would say I want to get the family around me. And I want to tell them that I love them. And that's good and commendable and I hope you can do that. Perhaps you would try to to amend a, a broken friendship or relationship with someone. There's been a gripe for many years and you're going to say before I go I want to sort this out. Say I'm sorry whatever you need to do. But you know the most important thing you must do is to make sure you're right with God because you only have today to get right with God you won't have tomorrow and you certainly when you pass into eternity you will not get a second chance Paul said one time behold now is the accepted time behold now is the day of salvation it's only today Someone wrote those words, the clock of life is wound but once, and no one has the power to tell just when the hands will stop at late or early hour. To lose one's wealth is sad indeed, to lose one's health is more, to lose one's soul is such a loss that no man can restore. And so that little phrase, come before winter, reminds each one of us at the start of 2017 of the brevity of life. We're in the winter season, aren't we? The last season of the, or the last season of the year. We think first of all of the springtime. You know, it's when the grass starts to grow again and the trees start to bud, and it's days of birth and resurrection, and we're, you know, we begin life's journey. And then we come into the summertime, and we're full of, uh, you know, of of life. We're bursting. You know, with energy and life is really good. Then it comes the days of autumn. The nights start to draw in a wee bit. The, the air gets a wee bit cooler. The grass stops growing. The leaves fall off the tree. And we know the year's moving on really quickly. And then you come to winter. There's more darkness and there is light. Nothing grows. And we know the end of the year is upon us. Many of us sitting here today, and I am finished now. Have been through the seasons of life. Some maybe looking around. Well the youngs have gone out. They're certainly in the spring of life. Others in summer. Some in autumn. Many in winter. And we all know that as you get older. We tend to think about the end. But I want to tell you. It doesn't matter whether you're in the spring of life. Or the winter of life. No one is guaranteed another day. We all know of people. Young in life who have been taken from us. And don't think just because you're full of health today and you've got a number of years ahead of you, so you think until retirement or whatever, that God will give you those. No one is promised tomorrow. But God in his goodness has given us today. And I would just say to you as I finish this message that if you're not right with God, it's got right with him today. Use this time to make sure at the start of 2017 all is well 
for eternity. Don't leave it too late. Because you might never ever get another opportunity. To ask for forgiveness. And I trust this year that we will have families complete. In Christ with all families and friends that don't know the Lord. And may it be this year. That the families complete. We'll pray and then we're going to take up the offering. Let's just pray for a moment. Father we do thank you that in your goodness you have given us another day at the start of another year and we can look back over the year that's gone and we yes we've messed up we've done things that are wrong but Lord this is a a new opportunity a new beginning and may it be today that it might be a new birth for someone that they might be born again into the kingdom of God and we know that you never refuse anyone who comes who puts their trust in the Savior Lord you never turn anybody away And we ask that you'll do that wonderful miracle of transforming a life. And we will give you all the glory and praise. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. As I said, the offering is going to be taken up. Thank you. Well, our closing hymn, the words will, will come up on the screen. Another year is dawning and we'll stand to sing. Father, we thank you for the time that we spent in your presence this morning. We thank you for these financial gifts that have been received. We just ask a blessing upon them. But Lord, as we uh, maybe fellowship with a cup of tea, just bless our time. And for those who have to leave now, take them to their homes in safety. And may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit remain with us, not just this day, but forevermore. Amen.